Hi, welcome everybody and thank you so much for spending yet another Friday with the network. My name is Tierra Labrada and I'm a senior policy analyst with the Supportive Housing Network of New York. For those of you who may be unfamiliar with the network, we are a membership and advocacy organization promoting the development of supportive housing as the answer to homelessness for individuals with behavioral health needs and other vulnerable populations. In lieu of our annual in-person conference, which usually occurs in June, the network has been hosting a series of online panels and workshops that take stock of our current social and political climate as we combat COVID-19 and social unrest due to the resurgence of overt racism in this country. Next week, we are hosting a bystander intervention training to stop police-sponsored violence and anti-Black racist harassment developed by the grassroots organization, I Holla Back. Just as a reminder, all of our panels and workshops are recorded and posted on our website at shinny.org, S-H-N-N-Y.org. And you can follow the network on Twitter and Instagram at the network NY. I'd like to uh, give a special thank you to all of our sponsors uh, who you saw on that lovely slideshow playing at the beginning of, the, uh, of this panel. And a huge shout out to our team, specifically Joel Balam schwan Cynthia Stewart, and Emily Levine, who helped put this panel together and who pulls all of our puppet strings behind the scenes. Um, we are going to reserve some time at the end for audience Q&A. So I would ask that you all please put your questions for the panelists in the Q&A part that is at the bottom of your screen. And as per usual, we are going to reserve our chat function for all of you who feel inspired enough um, to share your thoughts in the chat. So if you hear something from our panelists that inspire you, um, some jewels being dropped, some gems, uh, some words of encouragement or inspiration, please feel free to utilize our chat for that and reserve all of your particular questions for the panelists in the Q&A section. Our panel today will focus on the need for a new crisis response system and will eventually be moderated by New York City's public advocate, Jamani Williams. Jamani will be joining us in a few. He's been out protesting and in the streets uh, is what he is known for and what we truly appreciate him for. A formal council member from District 45, Jamani has had a long and illustrious career serving the public, implementing progressive policies and fighting for racial and social justice. The Public Advocates Office recently penned a report advocating for an improved response to individuals and mental health crisis. We will share that in the chat. Uh, Jamani is extremely well versed on this issue. Our other esteemed panelists will include Carla Rabinowitz, who is an advocacy coordinator with Community Access, Christina Sparrick, who is a mental health advocate for Correct Crisis Intervention Today, also known as CCIT, Tim Black, the Director of Consulting for Crisis Assistance Helping Out on the Street, also known as CAHOOTS, and Stanley Martin, a Project Director for Center for Community Alternatives in Rochester. So with that, I'm going to ask all of my panelists to please join me on camera. Hi. Hey, folks. Hey. It's, so, it's so good to see everybody. It's always nerve wracking when I'm on the when I'm on the screen by myself for the first two minutes, <laughs> but I'm I'm glad to be joined by our friends here. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, this panel is going to focus on the need for instituting a new crisis response system for people who are uh, dealing with mental health issues and getting the police out of that response system. So I'd like to um, toss it to my panelists to just briefly frame this issue. Uh, we know that this is not a New York City issue. This is a national issue. Um, and we are, we have been all grappling with the fatal uh, impact of police responding to people who are in mental health crisis. So I, I wanna toss it to Carla and, and Christina and Tim and Stanley um, to just talk a little bit about what, what you all have been seeing on the ground and um, how, how we can uh, lay, lay the groundwork for this uh, conversation. So, so um, I, this is a national issue. I mean, they are working on it in Portland and San Francisco and Los Angeles and Toronto even, all Denver, all coming up with models similar to Cahoots, but what is the problem here is that in New York City alone, just New York City, there's 200,000 mental health crisis calls a year. Almost all of those calls do not require police. Everybody agrees on that, even the police, believe it or not. So we need to get a health response to these mental health crisis, not law enforcement. Law enforcement was never meant 
to help people who are sick. And when the families are calling and the housing providers are calling, they don't want the person to go to jail. It's not that there's a crime. They're not feeling well. In New York City, we tried the training of police. We had a good de-escalization training starting in June 2015. And NYPD worked with us. But then a year later, more people were dying in police counters than before than were dying before the training. So we knew we needed a different approach. Um, from 2015, when the CIT training started to 2020, 16 people at least have died in New York City in police encounters. 14 were black or other people of color. In the seven years before that, before CIT training, 2007 to 2014, less than half people died. So training is not the answer. And, you know, we had approached the mayor, he had a task force, it didn't quite work out. And that's why we think there needs to be a private, um, a mental health team model. Thank you so much, Carla. I just want to pause and welcome Jamani Williams, our New York City public advocate. Hi, Jamani. Can you hear us? Peace and blessings. Yes, I can. Can you hear me? Uh, yes, absolutely. So we, we literally just got started. Um, my first question was just posing, posing the question of framing the issue. I'm going to go ahead and pass it off to you to share your experience and, and what your team has been working on uh, to getting the police out of this mental health crisis response here. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Apologize. Oh, hold on. I just did something here. Yeah. All right. Apologize for uh, for uh, my time here, trying to juggle a whole bunch of stuff. But I appreciate uh, you. I appreciate uh, support of Housing Network. I appreciate all the uh, people who are on this uh, panel right now. It's a very important uh, discussion uh, that we're talking about today. It's in everybody's mind. Um, it is a, a nationwide problem. Uh, we have this problem all over the nation, and it's. Uh, always compounded uh, with, uh, with race, uh, equity, and socioeconomic status as well on top of that, which we know always makes things uh, a bit worse. Uh, and the brutality we've seen at, at times when people simply needed some assistance is obviously unacceptable. Uh, we've had fatal responses to people uh, who have called for help, uh, medical assistance needed, and police responded, and um, people have died. Um, we are at the office putting forth a public safety model um, that talks about public safety, what it means, and what law enforcement's role is in that. Uh, we have to stop making public safety synonymous uh, with uh, policing. That's been an issue. Uh, and our current system, police are default responders uh, to a whole lot of things, as a matter of fact. Uh, anything that we can't fix or put in a box, we call police. Sadly, mental health uh, is one of those. And despite the uh, majority of cases needing a health response, um, the, the presence of police often makes those things worse. We know that uh, NYPD receives close to 180,000 mental health calls. That's just an NYPD uh, per year. It's a significant part of the workload. And one of the things that was missed around defund police where people kind of misunderstood that hashtag. If you don't have to respond to 180,000 mental health calls per year, that funding can go to people who actually have the expertise that can actually respond to that. Uh, you know, our NYPD, um, their their job is law enforcement, particularly acute criminal issues. Um, and they weren't really trained. Uh, they said there was gonna be training. We trained about a third of the workforce. Just recently, we kind of completely abandoned the program uh, that we had, uh, which makes no sense. Uh, police response results in uh, criminal justice system too often, 40% of New Yorkers held on Rikers Island is diagnosed with a mental illness. Rikers Island is probably the largest mental health facility in the country, uh, which makes no sense. Over the past four years, at least 16 individuals with mental health crisis have been killed by the NYPD, most recently in Queens, George Lopentes, who was faced, who was tased multiple times and died as a result of police interaction. Uh, the goal is not to have police be responding to people who have mental health, uh, mental health challenges. Uh, particularly in acute mental health crisis. The city has some non-police infrastructure uh, for mental health crisis, but it's very limited severely. Uh, and uh, you know why I uh, applaud what they try to do with uh, the First Lady's initiative, it's clearly not enough with a lot of money spent and not enough accountability. Uh, the 100 NYC well system, the number is too long. Uh, the response time is too long. Uh, the scope is too limited, uh, so we're advocating for 
uh, increase in NYC well operators. Uh, we want a shorter number like 988. Uh, we're trying to mandate a two hour response uh, time, uh, train 911 operators, uh, as well as a bunch of other things that we think uh, can make it much better. But it has to have resources, it has to have commitment. Uh, and that's some of the things that we're gonna talk about. And we invite everybody to look at the Office of Public Advocate. You can go to advocate.nyc.gov uh, and you can go to uh, our reports, Improving New York City's Responses to Individuals in Mental Health Crisis, and also our uh, brief document, a white paper on redefining public safety platform. And uh, that report on mental health crisis, uh, we had some input from some of the people who are on this call already. So I thank you uh, for that. Uh, and I, I understand the first question, uh, was the first question, why is it imperative we create a new system in NYC? Is that correct? Okay. Uh, why, why is it imperative we create a system new? Uh, what has been tried thus far in terms of addressing the issue and a little bit of what uh, you're proposing? And I know uh, Carla has spoken, so maybe we can uh, go to Christina. Uh, Carla that definitely shared the answer already. Thank you. You can go on to the next one. Okay. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Stanley. Thank you uh, for being here. Uh, we know uh, Rochester has seen sustained protests over the last several years, uh, several weeks. Uh, the community calls for justice for Daniel Prude, uh, who was killed by police in March. According to the family, Daniel was coping with mental illness and had been released from the hospital for only about four hours uh, before his fatal encounter with police. Can you tell us a little about your organization and what it's doing to reduce police presence in your community? Yes, so I work with the Center for Community Alternatives, and we are an organization that really censors the voices of community members, um, and we do advocacy and organizing to ensure that um, people's, people have access to, you know, basic human rights, like, you know, not having to be attacked by police when a family member uh, calls for assistance with uh, mental health. Um, I also work with Free the People Rock, who uh, is committed to Black liberation and um, defund and that we can see that being done through defunding the police as a means to abolition. Um, working with these two organizations, the main things we've been doing are uh, lobbying uh, legislators to talk about, you know, what it means to defund the police and really reframing it as reallocating resources that the community is in dire need for need of. Um, if we stop treating jails and prisons, as uh, mental health facilities and instead pour into families and communities who need assistance and who have historically been, you know, defunded themselves. Um, we, are, we understand that it would be a means to prevent mental health crises, a means to prevent um, mass incarceration. Uh, so we work uh, with, on that aspect, but we also work with organizing the community, um, getting people out um, and letting them know what is going on. Uh, providing space for discussion and education around what defunding the police mean. Uh, we've been sold a lie for centuries um, to make us believe that we actually need police, when in reality we need resources, we need education, we need access to uh, a living wage, we need access to health care. Um, so the organizations that I work with uh, work to empower people who are directly impacted by uh, institutional racism um, and police uh, brutality um, and, you know, uplift their voices and make sure we, we see sweeping changes throughout Rochester and hopefully the New York State. Um, and it seems that we, we lost a narrative around the, the, you know, people are focused on the hashtag defund police as opposed to what it really means, which it is, you know, discussing, um, you know, there are some people who are just, you know, complete abolitionists, most or not, but even if we're, if that's a goal, which is a good goal, we would need them, but even till then, it's not about tomorrow, it's about um, getting the resources that the police department are getting for a whole host of issues and redeploying that. How, how do we get that narrative back? How do we have that conversation in a way that people understand that we want everyone to be safe uh, and this is, this is about public safety? I, I think it starts with the larger community um, and understanding that the white supremacist media structure we have I do think within the media and how things are reported, there are a lot of inaccuracies and they do utilize language that, you know, is grounded in fear mongering and, you know, disempowering people. Uh, but I, I think having larger educational campaigns, um, creating different models of communities or, or looking at different communities who have successfully defunded the police and seeing uh, what harm, the like the decrease in harm across the board, the um, increase in, you know, overall health out outcomes when 
more when communities have more resources versus when communities have more police. Uh, we see in New York State, uh, education is being systemically defunded. Uh, so what does that mean? And why, if that is possible, I, I struggle to understand how it's impossible to defund the police and actually reallocate those resources to education, you know, things that actually empower us um, and allow us to thrive, not just survive. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that. And just as you pointed out, uh, just so folks know, in, in New York City, uh, the only organizations, uh, agencies that were defunded were, were anything except NYPD. Uh, so the DOE, uh, Department of Youth and Community Development, all these other agencies were defunded. <laughs> so uh, it was just interesting how they tried to spin that. Um, just got a question for Tim. Uh, the uh, CAHOOTS has been looked at as a model uh, and it's, the, the name has kind of been buzzing for a while, uh, what a successful crisis intervention system looks like. So can you talk about CAHOOTS and how other communities can adopt it what led you to get to that position? Was there, was there any friction or tension as you tried to move uh, from the model you had before? Sure. So CAHOOTS, uh, you know, like Tara said earlier, stands for Crisis Assistance, helping out on the streets. Um, our response teams are made up of an EMT and a crisis worker, uh, not, not a licensed clinical social worker, but more of an undergraduate or pure level crisis worker. And uh, the, the CAHOOTS teams respond to, uh, you know, behavioral health crises, housing issues, uh, calls related to, you know, addiction, uh, you know, really all, all manner of different crises that are occurring for folks, not just with their unhoused neighbors, but um, for folks who do still have housing as well. Um, our response, um, you know, has um, really, you know, helped us uh, get out there and really, um, you know, dramatically reduce the likelihood of police encounters for um, folks who are experiencing a crisis. And, um, you know, as far as like a, an economic impact locally, um, you know, for every dollar that's spent on the program, we're seeing five to ten dollars that are saved by the community. Um, as we have gone into, uh, you know, these conversations with other communities, uh, you know, there are a couple of the really key questions that, that come up time and time again are, uh, you know, what is the objective behind bringing this model into, uh, into a community? You know, is it really that, that, that kind of larger goal of, of removing police from the situations? Um, or, or is there, you know, is this more of a kind of a lip service thing, you know, to, to really just kind of, we're going to bring this thing in, we're not going to give it a lot of support and funding, uh, and it's just going to be there to kind of keep folks quiet. Um, as, as we, you know, really gauge that level of investment, we can really determine how much, uh, you know, uh, different stakeholders have really taken the time to really listen to the community. Uh, and, um, you know, and within that, um, when communities take that time to really listen to the voices of the folks that they want to serve, uh, we start to hear a lot more opportunity for dialogue around what are the services that are lacking in the community. Uh, you know, we, what we see with CAHOOTS here in, in Eugene and Springfield here in Oregon uh, is that, you know, a crisis emerges when a need goes unmet, you know, right, when there, when there are barriers to the resources to be able to address, uh, you know, that, that need. Um, and, and so, you know, there, there's some conversation going on around what are the things that are really missing, you know, from other cities to, to really empower, uh, you know, uh, folks to address their crises within the existing systems now. And then if a CAHOOTS program, something modeled after our response comes into, you know, a community, what are the resources, what are the, the connections that that team is going to be able to make to keep folks out of the criminal legal system and out of the hospital? Um, and that, you know, poses some really interesting questions and causes, you know, some potential tension because what we're doing there is, you know, it's not just a conversation about new first responders. It's really about looking at that whole system, right? Where the cracks are, where folks are falling through um, and, and really, you know, asking, you know, communities to prioritize things like shelter, you know, just having a place to sleep, decriminalizing homelessness, um, you know, making sure that folks have the ability to access the supports they need when they need them. Um, you know, and so there's this, you know, a lot of NIMBYs, you know, right, that not in my backyard crowd that, that's really resistant to this idea and can be concerned um, and buy into the magnet myth that if you build it, you know, if we build this system, you're just going to attract more and more folks in need. Um, that, that's combined with resistance, not from you know, line officers, folks who are, you know, officers uh, who are actually to, out. You, uh, you said anti-magnet? Uh, the, the, uh, the magnet myth. And ah, that's I that see. kind of, you know, that, that field of dreams, right? You know, if yeah. you build it, they will come, right? Um, there's, there's this idea out there that if you implement services in a community, 
then you're just going to be attracting more and more of those problem people, you know, right? And then that buys into that whole, you know, that othering, right? You know, that um, uh, the ability to use privilege to oppress and marginalize so many of our neighbors. Uh, that, you know, that community response of, of you know, that apprehension um, can sometimes be paired with resistance, not from, you know, officers out on the streets, but from the unions, right? The leadership um, who are, who are um, able to hide behind things like their contract and say, if you reduce our uh, call, you know, call volume by X percentage, then we're going to be in breach of the contract. So you can't implement this mobile crisis response system on the scale that your community, you know, that the community needs right now. Um, so those are, those are really kind of the two areas that we see a lot of tension is really from that, that leadership and that concern around, um, you know, what's going to happen if, uh, you know, revenue from citations is reduced, uh, you know, this, um, you know, white, uh, white fragility that allows us to assume that folks who are in crisis um, are going to be dangerous, you know, and, did, and that's coupled again, you know, like I said, go ahead. How did you, I want to know, how did you actually push through that to get the model in place? So uh, what we had to do locally here was really just just spend that time building those relationships. You know, it was going out, engaging with the community to, to talk about the fact that these are your neighbors, right? You know, um, you know, it, almost anybody you talk to can identify that family member, you know, that friend, that congregation member that's been impacted by mental health, that's been impacted by housing or addiction, uh, you know, by trauma. Uh, and so, so we've, we've worked really hard to really kind of humanize this, right, and normal, normalize this idea that um, there's not some sort of moral failing if somebody is experiencing addiction or experiencing trauma, uh, you know, that, that we need to really kind of shift to looking at these issues through a public health lens. Um, when, when it came to our work with officers, it was really showing up, you know, it was it was being there in their briefings talking about the types of responses that cahoots handles talking about how we approach these situations and then being actually out in the streets you know responding sometimes with officers or taking you know calls over from police after they showed up and um, that we were really able to demonstrate that uh, you know we had a role to play that we could be effective with our interventions and that ultimately we were part of the same system you know of, of first response and that uh, you know we need to be able to work together and there needs to be trust um, in you know the cahoots response for us to be able to achieve those goals of reducing police and EMS contact for folks who are in crisis. Thank you. That's uh that's amazing and very helpful. And you uh, you got me so uh, a new word magnet myth. I'm going to be using that. I just uh, wanted to say it. that Great. I just wanted to say that you know wall cahoots is like the long running model. Los Angeles just passed the city council model. San Francisco, Toronto. Denver, Portland are all having a model of a peer or clinician um, and an EMT. And that's what CCIT is proposing, a model of a private EMT and a trained peer separate from the police. Appreciate that. Thank you, Carla. Um, uh, just Stanley, really quick. Uh, the CAHOOTS model um, has been seen, has seen success in Eugene. Um, you know, Rochester looks a little different. It'd be interesting to see what happens in places uh, like LA, uh, where it's, it's not as homogeneous, uh, or again, it's primarily white police, but primarily white police force. Uh, how would you see cahoots functioning in, in the community uh, that you're in? So I think the most important thing would be, you know, how we put it all together and building it. Uh, currently, as we work to write legislation that would implement ca uh, cahoots, not only just in Rochester, but in Monroe County, we're making sure we have black healers at the table, black mental health therapists, um, black peers who have been directly impacted by a, a mental health diagnosis to actually write this legislation and understand, you know, the limitations or significant things that might be missed if we just implemented it without censoring their voices. Uh, although Rochester is is a heavily black and, and brown city, our police force is 90 something percent white. Um, so we want to ensure that we are censoring the voices of the people who who understand this, who have been impacted by, you know, calls from the police. We want to make sure that the Prude family, who has actively been involved in all of this, under um, is helping write this legislation and thinking of what if uh, a therapist or a community health worker showed showed up um, when Danielle Prude was was out there um, early in March. So making sure oh. that led by people who are directly impacted is a way that we want to uh, build this program here in Rochester and also including the voices of, you know, black mental health workers and black people who really understand this work and, and have a vested interest in making sure that black lives are protected when they, there is a call for mental health crisis. 
I think there was a collective woe when you read the the data demographics of the yeah. city and of uh, of the police force. That's yes. that's something. And uh, in addition, over ninety percent of them also do not live in the city. We live in surrounding predominantly white suburbs, so we literally have white men who are not from this community coming in and um, occupying our community. Wow, layer upon layer. Um, uh, Christina first, and then and, and then Carla. Um, I know communities are of more color, they grapple, as I mentioned at the beginning, with mental health, one as a stigma, in some ways that others don't, uh, and even though it's a stigma everywhere, uh, but they also have to deal with implicit bias. Uh, so can you talk about uh, how your CIT crisis intervention training sought to address this and uh, what the city can do now that unfortunately they have suspended even the programming they had for uh, CIT. Good question. Thank you. Um, so we all know that our criminal justice system has always been biased, like all our systems have been biased. And being a person of color and with a mental health condition, you're often viewed as guilty and too proven guilty. As we talk about bias in CIT, the crisis intervention training program, the program was never properly designed to address bias. When we think about bias and how we reshape how people perceive others, language is a critical role. The mere fact that the police patrol guide has throughout their guide, they refer to people with mental illness as EDPs, emotionally disturbed people, is bias. Why aren't we people first and people living, people having a, cri a crisis, which is not in the book? As, and it's given, if you train any group of people that another group, uh, a group of people are a deficit, then they will most likely discriminate the, against that group of people. Second, CIT in New York City hi is hired only social workers to oversee the program. Social workers are trained, mostly trained in clinical, clinical model, a model that views mental health people as a diagnosis and not as people. And these often social workers may not have limited knowledge of engaging with people in a culturally competent way, which is also biased. Having stigmatizing language and just having social workers while not incorporating and utilizing peers in the CIT programs and peers with those with lived experience would not lead to an effective CIT program and a positive outcome. And to answer the last question, since CIT has temporarily been halted by NYPD and according to the Gothamist, it cost about an estimate of $5.3 million to train 18,000 officers. If the city has this money sitting there, we can invest it into non-police responsive mental health calls, respite centers, 24-7 mental health clinics, community-based community, community -based programs. If we invest in communities, this leads to better health outcomes. That was great, Christina. You're, you're awesome. And <laughs> also the other thing CCIT has been saying is, listen, this training of police, which hasn't been working, right? Because more people are dying after the training than before, is $5.3 million a year. Our whole community CCIT pilot project is only 3.3 .3 million a year. So, okay, you got rid of the CIT training. Let's start a pilot project of an EMT and a peer, a peer trained in de-escalization in a couple of places where you have the most calls. Give them some vans, build up some supports. Uh, how do we address this in our proposal? I'm gonna talk about that in our proposal we make sure that we divide to find peers, not as person who's been in a psychiatric hospital, not as a person who takes medication. If you define yourself as a peer, if you say I live in a neighborhood where there's been a lot of violence, where I've had trauma, and I feel that I'm a person with depression, that's it, that's good enough. You have to define peer broadly. You also have to get as much community involvement as possible. So instead of these calls coming into like a New York City well, it would be great if a nonprofit in the neighborhood where the pilot goes, they, they staff the hotline, kind of like White Bird did in Eugene. But it has to be led by groups of people of color. And you have to have forums in the neighborhood at times that the people, people in that neighborhood or predominantly people of color can go. So you can't have a two o'clock meeting if everybody's working till five or six. So that's how we try to address it in our pilot project. And Jamani, we'd love to meet with you personally about our pilot project again at some point in person. I'm, I'm with it. You, you all are doing some amazing work. And I'm glad both you and Christina are, are on. And, you know, I'm, I'm always uh, 
about that conversation. Um, Tim, I had a, a, a question. I know this question is actually, uh, you know, if we get divergent views even amongst activists, but when, when do you think it is appropriate to utilize police? Uh, what can you say to support of housing providers who depend on police if there is a safety concern, especially when the mere presence of an officer can trigger someone? Yeah, <laughs> um, you know, really, I, I, when you ask that question, it kind of goes for me back to, you know, what you were talking about when you first joined us, Jermani, of, you know, this idea that, that we just keep sending police to everything that needs some sort of resolution, whether or not they're the right resource, we're sending them in when there's not anything else there. Um, so, you know, when it's appropriate to actually utilize the police is, is a tough question because, uh, you know, what what is the specific situation when it comes to, you know, I think the most emergent issue that we're addressing today around behavioral health crises, I think the, the appropriate amount of time to utilize the police is as little as possible. Um, you know, and, and there are a lot of things that um, need to happen to, to redesign the systems, you know, that officers are working within um, so that we can really reduce the need for them to be involved at all. Um, you know, it's, it's not just having a cahoots response. You know, it's, it's really having outreach teams, right? You know, it's having on-call clinicians. There, there's, a, there's an entire other system that needs to be built um, to really, you know, minimize this police contact. And I, it's, it's sad to hear, you know, the reality that so many so supportive housing providers are relying on police when there's a safety concern. Uh, and to me, that gets back to, um, you know, really uh, systemic issues with how um, organizations, how services are funded. You know, when, there, when there's a lack of resources within that, that supportive housing system um, to be able to address safety concerns without police involvement, that supportive housing system is failing because it's relying on another broken system in order to address, you know, really um, the the day to day issues of, of of the clients the patients that they're trying to serve so um, one of the things that we've tried to do locally to uh, empower service providers especially residential ones to have less reliance even on cahoots services is to go in and do really direct training around communication and de-escalation and that de-escalation is verbal you know it's it's really um, if if you if you train a group on how to use force to resolve a situation it becomes very easy to fall back on that last resort of force because it's going to be a quicker resolution than spending a couple of hours really talking with somebody. And so, you know, as, as we look at, you know, providers um, really looking to what they can do to reduce the need of police, it's really about, um, you know, what are the steps that can be taken to improve a, an environment, you know, to, to create more of a trauma-informed space so that crises are less likely to escalate. Um, you know, what is it that uh, the folks working within that system can do to de-escalate verbally without, um, you know, relying on those more traditional systems, um, you know, and you know, I think really it's important to recognize that, that that presence of an officer can trigger things. And that's an issue too with co-response as well, you know, not just with having officers go out alone, but, you know, when we hear from communities that say, we've got this handled, we have that co-responder team in our mental health unit, you know, those officers are still showing up on those calls with those social workers, you know, they're, they're still maintaining that presence, right, that those tools of force are still present in those crisis situations, even if you have a social worker present, as Christina, you know, identified with their whole, you know, set of bias, um, we're really not, you know, giving folks a therapeutic response. You know, we're, I think we're kind of checking some boxes so that we can say that something has been done. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, um, <laughs> I just can't say it enough. You know, we, we really need to be looking at um, why it is that we're calling police into these situations in the first place. Yeah, yeah they actually want to give you some space to see if you had uh, any thoughts on on uh, when we should actually utilize the police. I can't think of, I honestly truly cannot think of any at all. I do okay. think with, with situations and, and, and you know, sometimes people say, but what if someone has a gun? What if this, what if that? Um, I do think there should be a completely different group test with only responding to such situations. But currently we, Police are taking the roles of social workers, mental health counselors, uh, people who prisons are now, you know, housing for, for uh, to address poverty. So I, I really think what people need is care. What people need is unconditional positive regard. People need to be seen. People need resources. Um, and the more police we have, the more resources are being taken out of uh, the communities that actually need them. 
So currently, I, I just, I can't think of. Well, I, I would also say just uh, even between those two answers, I think we have to start from a framework of um, as little as possible. Um, and we have to come from the framework of what public safety is, um, because I think that's important that we have to get to this notion that police are not needed for everything and we can still be safe. Um, but you said something, even as I know, lean toward the abolitionist side, you said that uh, there might be a, need, a group of people who need to respond to certain things. Mm -hmm. Whatever that's called, we call it police now, but whatever it's called, it, I think will serve as a function of some sort of law enforcement, some sort of people who can respond to acute criminal situations, particularly there's violence. And I think that makes sense. And I think everyone uh, can understand it. The question is why are those folks now responsible to respond to mental health? To respond exactly. to housing and homelessness and exactly. once we can get that framework and people can understand we are talking about public safety everyone has a right to feel and be safe i think it helps that conversation when people have access to housing medical care mental health care mm -hmm. the community actually gets safe and we can use law enforcement for what they're supposed to be designed for um, and not what we keep uh, throwing them to uh, uh tim i do have a question um has there been any liability issues uh, since the cahoots model came in um, you know, we've never had uh, one of our responders, you know, seriously injured um, as a result of patient contact. Um, we do, you know, recognize that there is, you know, some potential because we are dealing with a lot of, you know, really escalated situations and, and are trying to support communities that have been oppressed and marginalized for generations. Um, so, you know, I think on a... Um, I guess more bureaucratic level, we have really strong indemnification language in our contracts. We have great insurance, but you know, really, um, because of the training, because of the approach that our responders take in the field, um, you know, we we don't have. I guess that that concern of liability isn't something that's up, you know, front and center every time you're going out to talk to somebody because we've trained our staff, you know, because we have uh, engaged in community education so that folks who are familiar with our service understand that this is something different, that they are not going to have that same kind of experience that they would have if they were talking to an officer. And what you bring to the point that we want to make sure we make clear, there's an assumption that these calls lead to violence. And we have to make sure we knock that down. The overwhelming a majority of anyone in these situations uh, doesn't lead to violence and mental illness is not a violent uh, illness. And we have to stop responding to it as if it is, and as you mentioned, sometimes a response triggers things uh, that would not have happened had we actually got the medical, uh, the, uh, the, the health response uh, that people are actually needing. And that's, again, I want to assuage folks because it's about safety. We want everyone to be safe, but we framed it so that people feel of police are not there, things are going to get out of control. When, so the, um, go ahead, Carla. Just, just, I just want to, you know, everyone's feeling like something like a who's could never happen in New York City. And I just want to remind people there's this tiny, tiny program that Transitional Services of New York is running in Queens, New York, around the Creedmoor Hospital, where they have like one peer and one clinician because they couldn't get an EMT. They've handled 3,000 cases, they have a six minute response time and only 3% of their people go to the hospital. They're not a souped up program. They don't have an EMT, they don't have a van. They just have a clinician and a peer. But 90%, 97% of the time, they avoid any contact with even a hospital. So it's possible to have something like this. I, I think that is a perfect, and I, I apologize because I actually am gonna be handing it back over to Tierra now for the question and answer. And I appreciate uh, the few minutes that I had here. And, um, I just want to say that I believe it's possible too. Uh, uh, I believe that reimagining public safety itself is possible. We have to have political courage uh, and uh, we have to have the political will. And until that happens, you know, the folks on the ground, the folks in the street, we have to keep pushing uh, to make it happen because we can't go back to normal because normal didn't work. So mm -hmm. we have to go back to better than, better than normal. I know the folks on this call, uh, this Zoom, uh, will help that happen. And uh, the people who are watching, will help it happen and just doing our best to reframe this so people don't believe for whatever reason uh, that we want people harmed. <laughs> That's not what we want at all. Uh, but the system that we have here uh, actually causes uh, more harm than uh, we would want and that we can reimagine this thing and keep people safe and have law enforcement as a partner. But the other partners have to be involved and they have to be funded. And uh, right now that's not happening with any equity. 
So thank you so much uh, for allowing me to uh, really moderate. Thank you so much uh, for the conversation we had. I haven't seen all the chats, but I saw it buzzing. So I know that people were engaged. So thank you so much. And I'll hand it back over to Tiara. Thank you so much, Jamani. Thank you for all of your work. I uh, just want to flag that we did put the link to the report in the chat. So if folks want to take a look at that, um, go ahead. Jamani, it was really great to have awesome. you here. Uh, we're going to we're going to go to our audience Q&A. We have some uh, really interesting questions in the, in the Q&A section. Uh, but my first one is to Stanley. You mentioned earlier about some legislation that you're trying to get passed, not only for Rochester, but for Monroe County. Can you talk a little bit about that? Because that, uh, other folks on this uh, that are listening that are not directly in New York City might find this uh, interesting, what you guys are trying to do rest of state. Absolutely. So uh, when this all first came out, the, the first thing we did was uh, uh, reach out to the Brood family and talk about, you know, what does change look like? What does it mean? So one of the most important things they want to ensure is that no one else nationwide um, has to ever um, experience the loss of a loved one after calling for mental health assistance. Uh, so in order to do that, they want to implement Daniel's laws. Daniel's law, which would prevent police officers from being first responders to mental health crises, but instead allow trained mental health workers, community health workers, and peers who really have a vested interest in supporting and helping people with mental health crisis um, being the first responders to uh, calls for mental health assistance. Uh, another thing we want to make sure is, you know, cr we create a different number for mental health crises. Uh, so it's not associated with 911, but people know when they call this number, they're going to receive actual help. Um, and this is to ensure that, you know, people get the, the help they need. Uh, in the city of Rochester and in Monroe, Monroe County, we have quite a few legislators um, interested in pushing this forward. Uh, statewide, we also have support um, from people who are willing to introduce the legislation and work to uh, make uh, this become a reality. Uh, because we see this not only happen in Rochester, but in New York City and Buffalo. So we want to make it countywide um, in Monroe County, but also expand to having this be a statewide thing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any other suggestions for, again, you know, we, we talked, uh, Tim talked a little bit about, uh, you know, when it is appropriate to use police specifically in support of housing. Um, so I, I want to toss it to Christina and Carla a little bit because you guys also operate, uh, Community Access also operates some supportive housing residences. What are some current alternatives that are out there that folks can use in supportive housing when uh, there, there may be the potential for a da danger for a tenant um, harming themselves or others or someone in, in crisis and, and staff might be concerned? So this, this, this is, is Carla. So yeah. the, the things that exist right now are pretty much non-existent. You have the co-response team, which is a, a, a police officer and a social worker, but sometimes it's just as bad as having police, because I've heard from people, you know, there's a police officer at my door, it's just as bad. Then there's something called the mobile crisis team, where you have a whole host of people come to your door who are mental health oriented. The only way to get that is called through New York City Well, New York City Well doesn't always send the mobile crisis team out and it can take two days and the mobile crisis team can transport anybody to the hospital. If they have to go to the hospital, the mobile crisis team has to call 911 and the mobile crisis team itself is not peer oriented, is not there to really look for someone's life experience and move them forward and help them in crisis. They're kind of a medical model, take the medication, go to the hospital. So the shorter answer is we don't have anything right now and it's really, really bad in New York City. Um, the situation with the police is bad. I hear about people getting dragged out of their apartments. I hear about people getting you know, taken from a library to a hospital for no other reason than they said they were taking medication. It's, it's bad. Yeah. Also with the call response team that we have now, a social worker and a police officer will respond. If the person that they're that needs is in need of help, if they have a warrant F for them, the police can arrest them automatically. Mm. And that would further escalate the situation. Instead of giving the person this the, the medical care that they need, they end up in prison, escalated and with the criminal record. 
And it's sad, it's every time when people call for a, a public health response, a mental health response, police show up like it's a crime scene. So they show up with guns, they show up with tasers, they show up with lights, and it's like a military force. So by the time they get to your house, you're already escalated, so they can't de-escalate you. They have uniforms on and guns. The neighbors know, so now you're embarrassed. And then when they take you out, it's just like a whole big crime scene. So it's not a good, it's not a good system, a response system. We need a, a peer response system with EMT coming. Yep. Yep. Um, Tim, so does the, we talked a lot about uh, mental health crisis and uh, folks are wondering, does the CAHOOTS model solve for uh, people with the developmental disabilities or other intellectual disabilities? Yeah, CAHOOTS teams can respond to really all manner of crises, you know, that are occurring in our community. Uh, we don't have restrictions, you know, based on what you're experiencing, what your housing or economic status is, um, you know, and that's that's why we have, have operated within that public safety system is because we want to really cast a wide net and, and have folks, you know, know that regardless of what their personal experience is, if they perceive, you know, to be in a crisis, we want to be accessible to them. And so we try to make sure that our response teams are really trained up in, you know, the, the various points of intersection that we're going to be encountering when we're working with folks out in the community. Excellent. I want to take the last couple of minutes here um, for you all to talk to the audience about ways that they can get involved um, in any sort of advocacy or some, some action steps now. Carla, I know our mental health response in New York City is... Uh, you know, non-functioning, um, <laughs> and you know, Stanley, you all are working on on things in Rochester to change. But um, I, I want the audience to be able to walk away with something. So, recognizing that this is a problem, and what are some steps that we, as a community, as a supportive housing community, uh, as individuals, what are some steps we can take to help address this issue or push that legislation forward? So, in New York, in New York City. You can join the CCIT NYC coalition as an organization or as an individual. It doesn't cost a cent. We meet a couple of times. We meet like four times a year. You can get more involved with the CCIT coalition by volunteering. Just go to ccitnyc.org. You can also go to our websites. I think it's the events page and send an email to the elected officials saying, uh, please, you know, support this proposal of a non-police alternative. Last, we didn't talk about uh, we didn't talk about it, but the NYPD is doing a survey, and it does include something on mental health if you want to. But I'd go to CCIT events page to send an email, CCIT proposal page to read our proposal, and CCIT contact us to join. Get more involved. I, I didn't make it main sound so bleak. We, we're meeting with Jumani. We're meeting with Senator Parker. We're meeting with Senator Liz Cruz. We have a lot of organizations. We're meeting with OMH. So in New York City, I feel very confident that in the next two years, we're going to have something. Um, we're meeting with people in the community. We're pushing forward at full speed. Um, and Christina wants to talk about the, um, this wonderful debate that's happening. So we're in the midst of COVID pandemic and economic collapse and combined stresses, unemployment and a lot of business failures. So a lot of people in New York City are feeling a lot of emotional wellness. And this is the time that we need to get our new electoral candidates like Scott Stringer, Eric Adams, Maya Wiley, Catherine Garcia, Carlos Manchata, Laurie Sutton, and others to take the stand and come to our mental health town hall on December 10th at 6.30 p.m. Thursday to talk about mental health, about non-police response to mental health calls, about, what, about housing, about education, everything that we need in our mental health community. So I ask that you encourage them to come, tweet about it, and I hope to see you all there. Thank you. Thanks, Christina. Stanley? Yeah, and in Rochester, as it relates to housing, housing there um, is a strong uh, tenant organizing group, uh, the Citywide Tenants Union, um, and there's also the Rochester Housing Justice Alliance, uh, cons consisting of many different organizations and people who are interested in um, ensuring that housing is a human right. Uh, today, for example, they have an action um, down at the courthouse. Uh, and one of the things in Rochester is the 15 people who actually have had their eviction warrant signed are all black. Um, so we are making sure that people understand that these issues intersect with race, class, and all these different things and using an intersectional lens. Um, the other thing I would say people should do is be informed about local politics. 
uh, our city council has the power to do so many things regarding housing and so does our mayor so being informed about who the people are on council and what they voted for um, and with 2021 20, 20, coming up we have five seats up so being politically aware um, and educating um, ourselves and joining some of these organizations is something people at home can do. Excellent. Tim, how can people find more information about the CAHOOTS model and others like it around the country? Sure. So uh, the, one of the best places to go to learn more about the CAHOOTS model is to go to the Whitebird Clinic website. It's whitebirdclinic.org. Um, you know, there are um, a whole host of different, uh, you know, links that we have in there as well as ways to request more information and set up conversations. Um, additionally, um, you know, I, I would be remiss if I didn't take the opportunity to just mention to everybody um, that the, the CAHOOTS Act is in Congress right now. Um, so please, you know, talk to your elected officials in the, in the Senate and House of Representatives and, and really, um, you know, encourage them to, to really take the time to um, look at this bill and, and support it. Um, if the CAHOOTS Act passes, that'll provide, you know, 95% of the funding for the first three years of programs based on the CAHOOTS model nationwide. So um, wow. talk to your elected officials and talk to your neighbors. Wow. So the CAHOOTS Act, it's in Congress right now. And can we find that on the Whiteberg's website, like a synopsis yeah. of the bill? That's yeah, excellent. we've got links to all that on there. So. Awesome. That's great. Um, any final thoughts for you all? Any want to final thoughts? Justice for Daniel Prude. Um, Justice for Daniel Prude. Thank you. Yeah, one one more thing. I just think that people like Jamani Williams, people like Donovan Richards, all the elected officials that support us. This is my feeling. We should let them know that they're supported. And I'm, I don't wish Jamani wasn't here, but we should let them know how much we appreciate what they're doing. You know, it doesn't have to be anything that is too much, you know, just let them know in an email or something. We appreciate or the person who sponsored the CAHOOTS bill and um, the U.S. Senate, you know, just let them know. Send them an email. Hey, give them a call. Hey, I support what you're doing. It's important to thank them for their work as well. And, and I think. Oh, Carla, you're on mute. There you go. I nope. just want to say thanks to Shinny and everybody else, all the panelists. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all so much for all of the work that you're doing, for being out there on the front lines for us, um, for protecting vulnerable populations, for participating in this panel, for educating us, for all of your advocacy and your effort. Uh, we, we certainly appreciate it. Again, as a reminder, all of our presentations and panels and workshops are recorded and posted on the Supportive Housing Network website, shani.org. And um, yeah, this has been great. I've learned so much and I'm always so inspired after talking to you folks. Um, so I appreciate you all. Follow us on social media, Twitter and Instagram, and make sure that you register for IHALA Back Bystander Intervention Training. If you appreciated this conversation, uh, the follow-up to that is going to be IHALA Back. You don't want to miss it. Uh, the Bystander Intervention Training tomorrow, uh, not, not tomorrow, next Friday. Mm -hmm. Next Friday, people. Keep, on, keep them Fridays coming. Thank you. <laughs> Bye, everybody. It was such a pleasure.